On April 17, 1918, the SS Dumeroop set sail from Portland, Oregon, bound for the South Pacific. Owned by the U.S. Shipping Board, the 270 feet, 500 ton wooden steamer would transport goods between the United States and the many Philippine islands approximately 7,000 miles to its east. Its manufacturers, the Grant Smith Porter Ship Company, had high hopes for their creation, but right away, ill omens prompted hushed concern. When the ship launched in Portland during the spring of 1918, it tumbled into the water and smashed into several houseboats on the Willamette River. The ship's captain, a hardy Scandinavian named Ola Berenson, dismissed the apprehensions of his anxious crew members, and they set sail for San Francisco during the finer climes of the late summer. The Dumarut departed the United States in September of 1918, made a stop in Hawaii, and then sailed on to Guam. Finally, on October 16, the ship sailed out of Guam's Opera Harbor destined for the Philippine capital of Manila. Only then was it loaded up with its final cargo, which just so happened to be several thousand gallons of gasoline and a monumental shipment of trinitrotoluene, more commonly known as TNT. As the Dumara pulled out of Opera Harbor, heavy storm clouds gathered on the horizon. Then, before long, the storm broke in earnest. The Dumara crashed through the roaring waves of the Philippine Sea, its crew battling the elements to keep her afloat. Then suddenly, disaster struck. A bolt of lightning streaked through the sky, striking the Dumaru's wooden deck and setting off a chain reaction that ignited both the shipment of gasoline and the crates full of dynamite. In the years that followed, survivor Theron Bean stated that the forwardmost portion of the ship simply erupted into flame following the bright white flash. Soon after, the call went out to abandon ship. The ship's crew rushed aboard its three life vessels, which consisted of a small raft and two boats. But in their panic, the men failed to evenly distribute themselves between the three vessels. This meant that while one of the lifeboats departed with just nine people aboard and eleven empty seats, the other became dangerously overloaded with over thirty terrified sailors hanging on for dear life. Soon after, the three vessels were separated by rough seas. On October 26, 1918, the Sunday Oregonian reported that Captain Berenson, his second mate, and three crew members had been found alive and well, they had been picked up by a transport ship just nine days after the Dumaru exploded. Their quest for survival was over. Their shipmates, on the other hand, were not so fortunate. Theon Bean, who found himself crammed aboard the boat of 32, stated that they rowed through the night until finally, the rising sun revealed Guam on the horizon. Yet, the Dumaru survivors were horrified when a sudden change of wind and currents sent their boat off course, floating aimlessly in the Philippine Sea. The men's hopes were reignited by the sudden appearance of a passing steamer. They began frantically rowing in its direction, waving and shouting as they went, but frustratingly, they remained unspotted as it sailed past them and into the distance. For the next few days, the sailors hoped and prayed for favorable winds. But as time passed, the situation grew critical. Their daily rations allowed for only two tablespoons of water and one piece of hardtack. Then, after seven days of drifting, they found themselves too weak to row. Around two weeks into their ordeal, the first of the survivors began to die from exposure. Three days later, they ran out of hardtack, while the heavens had failed to provide them with a single drop of rain. Some grew so thirsty that they began to drink salt water. All who did so died in agony just hours after their first sip. Other savvier sailors fashioned a makeshift catchment device, otherwise known as an evaporator, using their shoes, the boat's oars, along with some spare wood they'd managed to chip away from it, with which to fuel a small fire. It was a creative but futile attempt to replenish their water supplies. Ultimately, they decided that desperate times called for desperate measures. After a brief but confrontational discussion, one of the starving sailors took a rubber hose from a bailing pump and fashioned it into a makeshift fishing line. He then took a knife and began carving off pieces of his dead shipmate's flesh. After tying the meat to the improvised fishing line, he used it as bait to attract nearby schools of fish. Eventually, a group of dolphins passed by. 
After luring one ever closer with the tempting taste of human flesh, the sailors speared it, killed it, and butchered it. Theon Bean later wrote that the dolphin's meat and moisture were warmly welcomed but scarcely commended the method by which it was obtained. Finally, on the 24th day of their ordeal, the survivors of the SS Dumaru began to drift towards land. There had been weak celebration upon its sighting, and for the first time in weeks, the men felt some semblance of hope return. Little did they know, the worst was yet to come. As their lifeboat approached white tropical sands, choppy waves caused it to capsize. The surviving sailors were tossed among a seabed strewn with jagged skeletal coral, inflicting terrible gashes and scrapes to their tender sunburned skin. Some men were simply too weak to swim to shore and drowned among the coral, failing at the final hurdle. In a tragic turn of events, of the 32 men who climbed into the Dumaru lifeboat on the day it exploded, only 14 of them lived to tell the tale. Those that returned were treated as minor celebrities and, like Theon Bean, were venerated by a sympathetic media that was already buzzing with excitement over the Great War in Europe. They were treated as men of grit, will, and determination, while those who died were revered as great Americans, men who braved wild frontiers not just for their own enrichment but for the benefit of their families and their nation. Theon Bean claimed that upon their passing, his fallen comrades were given respectful burial at sea. But the truth was deeply and disturbingly different. Almost 12 years later, on January 1st of the year 1930, a man named Eliel Thomas published a book which stunned the American maritime community. It was entitled The Wreck of the Dumaru, A Story of Cannibalism. In his book, Mr. Thomas claimed that after extensive interviews with one of the ship's survivors, who wished to remain anonymous, it was quite certain that the shipwrecked sailors of the SS Dumaru had resorted to cannibalism in order to survive. The book caused outrage and indignation among vast swaths of the American public, so much so that a reporter from the New York Times was tasked with verifying Mr. Thomas's account. This reporter subsequently discovered that not only was Mr. Thomas's source a reliable one, being the Domero's assistant engineer Fred Harmon, but his narrative was identical to the U.S. Navy's own official version of the incident. According to the report taken from a U.S. naval base in the Philippine Islands, four of the Dumaru survivors passed away on the 18th day of their ordeal. One of these men, the ship's first engineer, had supposedly permitted his fellow sailors to consume his flesh upon his passing, and so they did. After carving off pieces of the dead man's flesh, the surviving sailors boiled the meat in a kerosene can. It tasted good, the assistant engineer reportedly stated. Everyone seemed to feel a little better after eating. The next day, the survivors ate a little more, but this time Harmon reported that the amount of salt in the meat made everyone sick and crazy. Harmon also stated that the proposal to cannibalize the dead was the suggestion of a Greek sailor he referred to as George. Wielding a hatchet, George was alleged to have demanded that they consume the flesh of the fallen. We're all dying, he reported George yelled, cook the chief or I'll do it myself. Finally, on the orders of the Dumo first mate, George the Greek prepared the flesh of the dead men for consumption and did so under the watchful eye of a lieutenant named E.V. Holmes. The lieutenant went ahead and ordered the Greek to place small parts of flesh on the wooden boat baler that was shaped like a large sugar scoop and then washed them in the sea. Harmon said afterward, the wooden baler was passed around to all. Harmon went on to state that George the Greek ate first and then, I quote, offered the flesh to Holmes who took it and ate it, thereby showing the rest of us that he desired us to do likewise. We ourselves had come around to George's way of thinking, and we decided to go right on with what the Greek started. Though the men had initially been horrified at the idea of eating their crewmates, they eventually agreed that it was, and I quote, the only possible means of saving our lives, and for our comrades, it was a fate not much worse than to be eaten by sharks. After eating the head engineer, they allegedly also ate a Hawaiian mess boy who had grown so weak that he couldn't move. Following the publication of Eliel Thomas's highly controversial account, the Dumas survivors admitted that the reports of cannibalism were true. However, the Connecticut Examiner went on to report that, 
Quote, speculation still persisted about several disappearances, speculating that some men jumped overboard and became shark food rather than risk being eaten by their comrades, and grisly unsubstantiated rumors of casting lots before an unlucky chief engineer and Hawaiian mess boy were killed, cooked, and eaten. Reports of cannibalism and the allegations of voluntary deaths include details that are beyond horrifying. But perhaps one of the more subtly chilling aspects of this case is that had it not been for a shift in the wind or had the passing steamer noticed the small lifeboat and come to its rescue, this grisly and terrifying episode might well have been averted entirely. A few years ago, I went on a Hawaii cruise with a few friends. It started out as a great little vacation. However, by the third day at sea, things started getting weird. After two days of eating constant sushi, I started to feel a little dizzy and lightheaded at times. My friends told me no more sushi, as it probably had something to do with that. But anyway, after a few drinks, I separated myself from my friends, who were sitting in one of the ship's many bars, and started walking back to my room because I really wasn't feeling too well. I took some weird lower deck route back in the direction of my room since some of the bars were on the lowest public levels of the ship. I asked one of the maids in the hallway which way was the quickest to get to the section my room was in. The maid had a very thick accent, but I understood her to have said, keep going straight, then make a left at the sign. So I did that. I came to a sign I don't remember what it said, but it was a sign, so I turned left there. I was in some narrow hall with a tiled floor instead of carpeting. It didn't seem like the right way to go at all, it seemed more like an employee-only section. Still, I figured I'd give it a chance before turning back and continued down this narrow hall. I came to a corner, then looked to my right, and here was the creepiest hallway you could possibly find on the ship. Half the lights were out, one was flashing on and off, but at the end of this tiny hallway was someone standing, facing the wall. My head started to hurt even more as I saw this. I had to rub my eyes to make sure what I was seeing was real. When I moved my hands away from my eyes, the person standing by the wall was now looking at me. Considering they were standing in the dark section of this hallway, not lit up by lights, I couldn't really see much about their actual face other than that I knew they were looking at me. I turned and went back the direction I came. I walked back down the hall the maid was gone now. However, with my head still killing me, I managed to get back to the lobby of this floor, and at that point, finding the elevators was easy. I made it back to my room easily at that point and crashed into bed. I was sure I had gotten food poisoning from the sushi because my stomach was also hurting along with my head. Anyway, I woke up at some odd hour in the night and I couldn't move. The only thing I could move were my eyes. I tried looking around the room, but my inability to move my head or sit in an upright position made seeing a lot of the room difficult. I remember something seemed to appear in my peripheral vision. I turned my eyes to the opposite side of the room and there was a figure facing the wall. As I looked at it, I wanted to scream or run, but I couldn't do anything. It was as real as could be, I knew I was seeing it. The head of the figure turned around to face me, but all I saw was black. The body, the face everything about this figure just looked black. The figure started to move closer to me. The most disturbing thing about it, though, was that as it moved towards me, it didn't move its limbs it seemed to just slowly float towards me. The figure stopped over my bed. Now I could slightly see a face to it, and I recognized it as that person I saw earlier in the night in that hallway. I don't remember exactly how long that figure stood over my bed, but suddenly I saw its mouth open twice as wide as you'd expect to be humanly possible. Out came a deafeningly real scream, so loud that I think it woke me up completely from the sleep paralysis I was just in. The craziest thing I remember was the scream of this sleep paralysis figure feeding into the scream of my own voice. I was finally able to make a sound. I flicked on the light, and my friend who was in the other bed woke up asking what was wrong. I told him about the horrible experience I just had. He once again said I'd been eating way too much raw fish and it was messing with my head. 
My whole body was shaking, and my voice was trembling. I went back to sleep and don't remember having another dream that night. But I still wonder if that person I saw in the hallway was real or not, because I'm 90% sure that's the hallucination I had in my paralysis. That hallucination was also the realest, most horrific thing I'd ever seen. Back in the late summer of 2007, I was working on a tugboat that was assisting an oil tanker off the coast of Louisiana. There had been some storms and rough seas, so as much as we weren't in any danger, our tug had been helping to stabilize the tanker, which was way more vulnerable to the large waves. I always loved the water, and I still do, but on the morning of August 10th, as we were guiding that tanker along the coast, something put that love to the test in a big, very bad way. I was in the bathroom when it happened probably the worst place you can be when you get hit by a freak wave. I had been awake for maybe no more than 5 to 10 minutes, and then out of nowhere, everything got turned upside down. One second the toilet was on the floor, and the next, it was on the ceiling. I tried to open the door to the bathroom, but all the lights suddenly went out, and I could hear the bathroom slowly filling with water. I couldn't tell if it was blood or seawater stinging my eyes. Then I finally got the bathroom door open, but I didn't have long to celebrate because I felt this heavy thunk as the tugboat touched down on the seabed at least 100 feet below the surface. When we got the door open, everything was dark. Water was everywhere, and I had no idea which way I was facing. Our propeller was up, our wheelhouse was down, and in the alley next to the watertight door, which led to an exit hatch, I saw two of my co-workers struggling with the hatch as the water levels continued to rise. I panicked, thinking we'd all drown if we failed to get that door open, so I did something completely against my instincts and dived into the water to look for a different way to escape. I don't imagine many of y'all have been in a shipwreck before, but when your ship goes down like ours did and takes on a ton of water, it rushes through your ship in very odd patterns. Imagine pouring a gallon of water into an ant farm and watch how it reaches some tunnels faster than others and creates little air pockets here and there. Well, that's how I managed to get swept into a second bathroom, this one attached to the second engineer's cabin. With the door having been swept shut as I pulled into it, it created one of those air pockets I had just mentioned. At first, the water continued to rise, and I thought that I was going to be trapped in there and drown, but to my relief, it didn't fill the bathroom completely. It only filled up about a third of the way and then just suddenly stopped. Part of the reason it didn't fill up was because we routinely kept all the cabin doors closed. We did this mainly as a security precaution, but it also secured parts of the ship from flooding and meant that I could cling to a wash basin in my own private air bubble at the bottom of the gulf. As I stood there in the darkness, I started to hear my co-workers screaming and yelling. I couldn't make out what they were saying, but I figured that they might have gotten the hatch open, so with that in mind, I decided to do everything I could to swim back to them. But when I tried to pry the bathroom door open, the door handle snapped off in my grip. I remember feeling a panic rising up in me again, one so intense I thought that I might lose my mind right there and then. But then suddenly, it just stopped, and I felt this strange sense of calm wash over me. Everything that had happened over the previous few minutes had been so chaotic and terrifying, but after that door handle snapped off in my hand, it felt like I had control of the situation. I knew where I was, I knew what I needed to do, and I had no choice but to solve the problem of opening the door. It was that or die trying, and as crazy as it sounds, just thinking that to myself all these years later brought about that strange sense of calm. It was just me and that bathroom door. Whatever came next, we could cross that bridge once we came to it. I remember spotting a vent and thinking that if I pulled off the steel grill, I could probably use it as some kind of tool. Luckily, it was strong enough for me to use to force open the bathroom door, but that wasn't an instant thing. It took a lot of time and effort, and during the attempt, I heard the cries of my co-workers going silent one by one. I thought they had escaped, but now I know differently. Once I had the bathroom door open, I was back in the second engineer's cabin. I saw two life jackets, each with a small flashlight attached. I put one in my mouth, 
lodged the other in the elastic of my underwear, and then attempted to swim for the escape hatch. Outside of the cabin, all the corridors were full of water with no air pockets for me to use, meaning every time I ran out of breath, I had to stop trying to open the hatch and swim back to my air pocket in the engineer's cabin to take a breath. The first time I swam back, I almost missed the door to the engineer's cabin. It was dark, all the doors looked the same, and I knew that if I got lost or confused, I'd most likely drown. I later found out the exact confused, I'd most likely drown. I later found out the exact same thing happened to a co-worker who drowned in the mess room after confusing it for someplace with an air pocket. To stop myself from getting turned around, I tore off some fabric from one of the engineer's coveralls, tied it into a rope, and then attached one end to the door of the cabin so I could use it to guide myself back whenever I ran out of breath. I tried again and again, but still, the hatch wouldn't budge, and I eventually decided that I should save my strength, stay in my little air pocket, and rethink my attempts to escape. I had to just stay put, stay calm, and think. And I'm not kidding when I say hours went by. I ate tin sardines and drank canned soda just to keep my energy levels up, but I had to keep my legs out of the water. I knew I'd scraped my leg during one of my escape attempts, and at first, I thought the stinging was just the salt water getting into the wounds, but I quickly realized it wasn't just the salt water. It was little crayfish swimming up to pick at the peeling skin around the wound. I also thought the water level would remain stable, but after a while, I realized it was slowly rising from how it seemed to be creeping up the wall. And that's about the time I just accepted that I was going to die. I kept thinking about my family, and it brought me a strange sense of peace knowing that they'd be there to carry on without me. Sure, it would hurt some my kids would grow up without their father but they'd no doubt get a big payout from the company, and then on top of my life insurance, they might just get a big enough check to keep them comfy for the rest of their lives. Imagining and thinking those kinds of thoughts was all I could do to comfort myself, and I remember just sitting there, trying to conserve whatever oxygen I had left, in total silence, just waiting around to die. Then suddenly, the silence was broken by the sudden sound of metal on metal. It was like a hard clunk, and although I couldn't see what was going on outside the boat, I knew that there was a good chance someone was out there, someone that might be able to hear me. I didn't scream or yell, as that would have burned valuable oxygen. Instead, I started to hammer my fist against the bulkhead, hoping whoever was out there would recognize that someone was alive inside the tub. Minutes later, I saw a light through one of the portholes and realized that there must have been divers swimming around outside. I took a deep breath and then dived back into the water. My goal was to find a porthole through which I could see the divers, so I went room to room, prying open doors, then heading back to the air pocket for another gulp of oxygen. Then back I went, repeating the process over and over until finally, I caught sight of the divers outside. I remember pushing my hand up against the safety glass, and one of the divers later said he just thought it was another body at first. But when I started trying to bang on the glass, they realized I was alive. I wasn't taken straight to the surface you'd think that that might have caused more emotional turmoil than it did, and after being trapped in a wreck like that, most would want to return straight to the surface. But you can't do that the sudden change in pressure might actually kill you. So I spent a real long time in a diving bell, sucking air from a spare oxygen tank, before I was allowed to resurface. The divers told me I'd been down there for almost 14 hours. I don't even think it felt like three. I guess my sense of time was disoriented, but resurfacing to the night sky instead of daylight made it feel like I time-traveled or something. A bunch of medics checked my vitals to ensure my temperature and blood pressure were okay, and then they advised that I go visit a hospital. But all I wanted to do was get home to my wife and kids. So, although I wouldn't advise anyone to ignore medical advice like that, I went straight home and gave them all the biggest hugs of their lives. I had some real bad dreams for a long time afterward. Sometimes, I'd feel like my bed was sinking, and I'd wake up with sweat-soaked bed sheets, which I guess prolonged the process of realizing it was just a nightmare. Other times, I'd dream that water was rushing in via my bedroom windows and that my wife was unconscious. I'd pick her up, carry her to the door, but it wouldn't open, 
and the water would just keep rising and rising until I woke up. Some friends suggested that we just take a vacation someplace really landlocked, you know, and that helped a whole lot. I stayed away from the pool for a whole week and a half, though, until I finally forced myself to face my fears. I guess the context of that vacation helped, knowing that I was safe. And like I said at the start, I've always loved the water. Thanks for watching the video. Subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications to watch the latest videos.